everyone welcome back you'll likely notice this slightly different background on these slides and that's because these slides were prepared actually for an event that we hosted between the Canadian Institute of Food Science and Technology and Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and I originally prepared this slideshow uh, approximately a year ago now for the Canadian Institute of Food Science and Technology or CIFST's tabletop and we initiated an education program at that point to um, take advantage of the fact that we had brought uh, likely 2,000 food scientists from across Canada into the same convention center. And we wanted to make sure that we were increasing the um, education and training opportunities for these food scientists as they were going through continuous improvement. Um, What's been really great uh, working with the uh, board of directors of CIFST is that we are really focused on delivering a lot more um, learning opportunities. And as such, this past year, we had some really great webinars as part of the online virtual showcase, and we've got some fantastic webinars coming up. So I do highly recommend taking a look at uh, CIFST, CIFST.ca, and checking out the webinar um, content that's coming up very soon. I delivered this as part of the free series and I feel that it has value to both the students in my course in innovation practice at Niagara College as well as for those of you who are following along on the channel. So the talk was on intellectual property strategy for small food businesses and I do have to use my wonderful CBET um, at the end of this video. You will have learned slide so that was not in the original video but uh, the rest of it was in the original lecture and I actually gave the lecture in person so let's jump ahead so again uh, the talk was originally developed for agriculture and agri-food Canada and CIFST's tabletop education program which was uh, run on November 12th 2019 and thanks to Horst Donner, Jennifer Foster, Annick Bovin, Benoit Rancourt and Nancy Gardner from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and Anne Manley and Tim Stover at CIFST. And at the time I prepared this lecture, they were, um, I had to put in a uh, disclaimer that my opinions were on my own. That said, I do take advantage of the fact that in my professional role, I interact with a lot of different industry partners. And so these were true case studies. The identity of all industry partners has been obscured, but the case studies are derived from real examples. And so um, non-disclosures being adhered to, but at the same time, I wanted to make sure that you were given real examples in a way that could be meaningful to you as you're uh, traversing your food science journey and your food innovation journey. Oh, I had to have that CBAT slide. So at the end of this video, you will debate a number of case studies of food industries and their intellectual property scenarios. You'll investigate the roles of different types of intellectual property in food and beverage products in Canada. And we'll discuss how to do some basic IP searches online for trademarks and patents. So the challenge, small and medium-sized enterprises, when I use the term SMEs, sometimes you'll hear it being used SME for subject matter experts. In my case, I'm using it for small and medium-sized enterprises. So we're constantly bootstrapping within business practice. There's a high awareness for intellectual property, but its use is low. And we'll talk a little bit about the politics of that. The logistics of how to make intellectual property work for food companies is a bit convoluted. So that's why I wanted to use the case study based strategy to show how other companies are doing it. And in some cases, using cautionary tales that Here's a way that a company may have been thinking they were using intellectual property, but really could have done it in a different way that would have maximized their opportunity. There are some core strategies used intellectual property in Canada. 
The primary one that I see is trade secrets. And honestly, uh, we'll talk about the definitions of each of these, but trade secrets is where you just keep everything under tight control and under non-disclosure. And there's not a formalized um, registration process, such as you'd see in trademarking, where you have brands or um, visual brands that need to be protected, or patents, where you have a, a, a really core idea that needs to have some sort of disclosure and then protection behind that disclosure. Plant breeders' rights and geographical indication do come up in agri-food in Canada. Plant breeders' rights not so much for food systems other than perhaps if you are involved in uh, traceability and being able to do origin traceability on certain um, agricultural products. Geographic indication, though, that one is where a food product has a geographic zone that it came from and is that food product is then prepared to a standard of identity. As such, that food product is allowed to have special branding and have a geographical indication as part of its brand or trademark. And that has a lot of different implications within food. So let's do a quick summary here. There was a really great report put out in uh, early 2019 from the um, Industry Canada Intellectual Property Office. And the awareness of intellectual property use in general industry in Canada is extremely high. The awareness, so people know that it's there and know it's important, but the percent of organizations that are actually using it is extremely low. And in food industry, we'll dig into why that usage is low. From an innovation perspective, in agri-food, uh, to have something that's patentable, it has to be eminently, um, it has to be eminently non-apparent to someone with a similar level of education and experience. And what we see from an innovation perspective in most of agri-food, that most of the innovation that's occurring is incremental. It's stepwise improvements off of historical long-standing technologies, or in some cases, it's incremental that we are taking technologies from other domains in engineering, manufacturing technology, and, and so on, and applying it to human food systems. And because of that incrementality, if I can use that term, we're oftentimes, as food scientists, the uh, pardon the term, but poor cousins of some of the other advanced manufacturing sectors because we are borrowing. Food science inevitably is an applied science and as such we are oftentimes just borrowing technology and that in its own right uh, has part of that usage challenge that in many cases it doesn't make sense to go and patent an idea. It makes more sense to be focused on the use of trade secrets and non-disclosure agreements rather than trying to go and lock up things in trademarks and patents where registration fees add to cost of goods and it adds to the complexity of being able to um, go out and implement the innovation that's occurring. In the case of agri-food specifically, from a global perspective, we do see an increase in patenting, but the net numbers are still quite low as compared to the number of patents that are occurring in broad technologies, um, internet manufacturing, biotechnology, uh, medical and pharmaceutical, and so on. The sheer numbers, while they are growing considerably from 20, uh, uh, 2000 to 2017, the net numbers are actually, as a, as a global whole, they're actually quite low. And so that's an interesting consideration. Now, we will talk a little bit about why we're seeing more increase. And I think part of that is that there are more provisional patents being um, filed. In the past 20 years, there has been a shift in the landscape from companies bootstrapping their own innovation to more of a venture capital driven 
approach to agri-food. And as such, venture capitalists like to know that there's going to be some form of, of um, protection on new ideas that come into play. And the filing of a provisional patent means that there's a 12-month grace period that that intellectual property more or less is controlled during that 12 months. But you may not go ahead and do the full filing on that patent. Having that intellectual property partially secured through a provisional patent gives a sense of security to the uh, venture capitalists that say, well, we expect to have some sort of saleable content. Their venture capital is often bringing the mindset of technology, computing technology, manufacturing technology into the food sector. And that same finance based mindset doesn't necessarily equate when it comes to food products and consumer packaged goods. But in the end, they see on the on the superficial level from a due diligence perspective that there is a provisional patent in place. I think this is something that needs further analysis. I am going based off of my own anecdotal experience, seeing hundreds of companies go through um, venture capital and the, the type of feedback that I'm getting from these small businesses that are experiencing it. So when you're going about patenting, it is a, uh, you have to think about products, you can think about compositions, you can think about machines or processes, and the improvement on any of these in a way that's not apparent to someone with a similar background to your own. The big challenge is that in Canada, it takes, uh, based off of that CEPO report that I mentioned before, the Canadian Intellectual Property Office takes approximately 33.6 months from the time that you want to have a patent examination. That's the time frame that's taken in Canada. And I think this is important to note that that examination time frame is not the speed of business. That's almost three years and business decisions need to be made in extremely timely fashion and venture capital decisions need to be made in almost split second decisions. 33.6 months for examination of patents is very unrealistic and that I think from an innovation perspective in Canada, we need to invest more in the entire value chain on innovation including patent reviewing and so on. Now, do we see clusters? The, uh, the, I, I put this slide in because it was interesting. There are clusters, this is related to the fishing industry in particular, but where are we seeing clusters? We are seeing clusters related back to technology centers, so universities, we're seeing it cluster specific to technology access centers as well. We have to think about the fact that there is natural clustering and within urban settings, because of the networking that's occurring related to venture capital, it's happening at a bit of a more breakneck speed in that case. There is a bit of a directionality on patents in that when it comes to uh, launching food products into the marketplace, the typical uh, pace of formulation is going to be approximately six months for the very, very fastest and most nimble of companies to about 18 months. And as I mentioned before, the typical patent review process is 33.6 months. And so this is another aspect to barriers for use of patents, but We'll talk about the function of patents a, a, a little bit more in the following slides. The speed of business between what's required from a commercialization perspective within food companies is not the same speed of business for filing patents. And as such, this is always going to be a barrier for Canadian companies to go through that process. And that's why anytime a, a small food business uh, picks up the phone and calls me and says, hey, we think we have something that's really unique and novel. Can we have a confidential conversation with you? And I say, sure, let's let's chat. And 
oftentimes it's like, yeah, and, and in order for us to get investments, we need to have a patent. And I'm just sitting there shaking my head going, what you really need is a trade secret and a non-disclosure agreement. And you then need to be first to market from an agility perspective. We'll talk a little bit about the fact that so much of food, because it's incremental, doesn't actually meet that um, innovative aspect of being patentable. And so you can go ahead and put out a provisional patent, but it, on review and full filing, it will not pass the patent process. So this is the sort of question that really needs to be uh, thought of from a really, really strong consideration perspective. Does your product really need a patent or does it really need other intellectual property um, management strategies? So as I mentioned before, the politics of patenting has really shifted in the past 20 years. And we see this with the rise of venture capital. I put our friends, the dragons from uh, CBC's Dragon's Den up on here because there has been a shift. Venture capital historically focused on large manufacturing and large um, technology. And honestly, from a market volatility perspective, food's, food's a safe bet. We are always going to be eating food. And food weathers the storm quite frequently. And so venture capital, from a diversification perspective, has been really interested in the role of food within, within portfolios. But the challenge is that from a, from a directionality perspective, historically, it was government, research institutes, universities, etc., where a lot of that intellectual property was developed. And then those institutes would put down intellectual property barriers and governments aren't in the, in the role of commercializing products. They're in the role of providing research services. And the government doesn't want to be out there in the free market trying to sell product. The intellectual property done by government research centers becomes a barrier to commercialization because then all these royalty structures come into play and purchasing of intellectual property that was originally funded through government funds becomes that barrier. Um, honestly, Patents and intellectual property within the private sector make a lot of sense. Patents and intellectual property within government roles need to be really done cautiously because publicly funded research should be out there for the services of the public. I, I understand fully that intellectual property has the purposes of recouping costs on innovation, but Innovation that's done for the public good should be positioned in a role for the public good. I mentioned before that aspect of patents as prerequisites for venture capital, but um, again, I often caution both venture capital groups who come and say, well, we won't invest in company. We, we see a huge spike of this in uh, the cannabis edibles component, for example. We will not invest unless we know that there's some sort of intellectual property protection. And immediately the first thing out of their mouth is, well, we need to see a patent. Intellectual property protection could be trade secrets. It could be non-disclosure. It could be speed to market because while that's not an intellectual property protection, it is a market protection to have the first name that's recognized within the marketplace for your product. In many cases, Food products can be broken by code breakers who are really good at reverse engineering formulation. Now let's jump into some case studies. Oh, let's, uh, I see a picture of a hemoglobin protein. And actually this is a case study from my own, uh, from my own graduate studies. Um, anyone who's looked me up online uh, knows that I did a lot of research in plant hemoglobins a long, long time ago. And I remember going into the Guelph um, the University of Guelph Intellectual Property Office and talking to them about our work on plant hemoglobins. And at that point in time, all of the assessments said, you know what, this is, um, this is interesting. It's, it's a, it's a really nice application and all good. No intellectual property was filed. And 10 years later, 
the Impossible Burger comes out using plant hemoglobins as its source for creating that veggie burger uh, bleeding function. And part of me is going, oh man, I, I could have been a millionaire. But part of me is saying, you know what? I, at the time, was not in a position where I'd be able to manage that intellectual property properly. And from a public good perspective, the strategy that we had initially um, conceptualized, the fact that we did not use intellectual property meant that we were able to get a lot of uh, research funding from the from the public sector and from different non-governmental organizations because initially the intent was for nutrition. The patents related to leg hemoglobin use are more specifically about the cloning methodology and the ability to bulk um, create it in bulk fermentation. And that, I think, has a, uh, very interesting aspects to it. I speak quite openly about that because that was my own personal experience. But you have to, uh, the take home message on this slide is really about thinking about what's the meaningful uniqueness in this, using a Doug Hall aphorism. Um, in this case, it was deemed that there was more public good to be had by not locking something into intellectual property. Two, that the research was too preliminary to be able to lock things into intellectual property at that point in time. Oh, I mentioned this before. Uh, a lot of companies are going out and patenting things that really, they're spending a lot of money filing patents and the whole intent is to be able to walk into a venture capital investor meeting saying, we have patents, not because of the meaningful uniqueness of those patents. And what we're seeing a lot of this in the cannabis sector, even more so in 2019, before, right before the legalization of cannabis edibles. Honestly, every venture capital meeting that I was asked to sit in on, the companies would say, so... Um, are all of your formulation strategies locked up in provisional patents? And no company worth their salt wanted to say, no, we don't have any provisional patents. So it was almost a bit of a game where you'd go and file the provisional patents knowing full well that you would not ever go ahead and file the full patent because that would not pass the barrier of meaningful uniqueness. So that's something that's a gamble that only uh, CFOs within food companies or within cannabis companies are going to make. Filing a patent is not a cheap experience. It's usually running in the ten or twenty thousand dollar range. There are um, lawyers that will do it for a bit cheaper, but in general, you can do a lot of the legwork on the front end yourself in terms of describing it. But you do want to have a uh, an actual intellectual property lawyer filed that patent for you in the end. And again, that costs money. And so do you go ahead and file these provisional patents knowing full well that you're not going to go and file the full patent in the end? It's a gamble. And a lot of companies, especially in the cannabis realm, played that gamble. I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer. How about this one? Oh, this one, this, this is, this is a charming example. And I remember reaching out to these two young ladies, um, city, New uh, city news back in 2017, they had a wonderful feel good story about two high school students who were in a innovation engineering class in their high school. And they said, Oh, well, we have come up with butter on a stick and the, the news was all over them, and honestly, I really admire their ingenuity and their creativity, and I sincerely hope these two young women go on to amazing careers in innovation or engineering or um, product design because they showed a wonderful spirit of creativity. And the gist of the uh, news story was these two young women had created Butter on a Stick, and they were going to go ahead and look for patenting ideas. And the first thing I said was, have they done a patent search? And the question or the response was no. Um, honestly, it is very easy to do patent search. And Google has a patent database. Um, 
a lot of different internet databases are available. Some of them cost money. Google's database is free. I can't stress this enough to uh, people who say that they're going to go ahead and patent something. Do a lot of the initial research yourself. Start looking up keywords about your innovation to see what is out there and find out what patents have already been filed. In the case of these uh, young women who um, said that they had developed the new butter on a, uh, butter in a dis dispensing stick, there already had been a patent filed in 1997 for butter in a stick. And based on my calculation, that patent should be um, in the public domain at this point because there is a uh, expiry on um, a lot of patents around the world. And in many cases, unless there has been a substantive improvement to the concept, the patents go into public domain after a period of approximately 17 to 20 years. So that would have been 23 years ago. And in general, patents do expire. So they could just go and put butter in a stick and not worry about the patent because it was patented. And that patent now is in the public domain. So the take home message from this slide is take the time and do look up what has been already patented in your domain. And I can't stress enough, patents.google.com is a free database that covers most global uh, patent databases. So you can find out where your concept may already be patented. And in some cases you can find out um, what patents are already in place. There are other databases too, and this is worth noting, that there are databases of what are called distressed patents. These are patents that are no longer being maintained and the, the, the costs of maintaining the filing are not in place. Or you can also go and find databases where patents are on the verge of being um, going into the public domain. And this is a really cool thing uh, to investigate because if you know that something's going to come into the public domain within uh, a year or two's time, that's your time to start quietly innovating behind the scenes and think about what sorts of incremental improvements could take place within that patent space. Oftentimes, that's a space that's, um, not to use a predatory term, but you can, you can be almost predatory, taking over a patent concept that has now come into the public domain. So related to patents, I can't, uh, just a quick summary, advice to small and medium sized enterprises, do your searching beforehand. You can search online for free. Um, Google databases are free. Do find out what's in patent control and act a little bit like your own paralegal. Do a lot of that legwork and research on your own that you want to make sure that anything that you are going to patent, one, you um, are not in an infringement of someone else's patent. Two, that you have a truly meaningful and unique concept that meets the requirements. Three, I, I, I didn't bring this up in the previous slides, but if you are going to go and patent, that you then have the wherewithal and the willingness to continuously evaluate and scan the environment and prosecute against any companies that you feel may be in uh, infringement of your patent. So don't just go and patent stuff and then forget about it. Patent knowing that the biggest um, aspect to this besides investment and venture capital is that you should be able to prosecute against it if you find a company that is in infringement. And in some cases you can prosecute and gain financially from that, um, that scenario. Don't patent stuff unless you're willing to prosecute. Take the time to research on your own and then get some legal advice. Do take advantage of an intellectual property lawyer and finalize all of those ideas with an expert to make sure that everything that you are suggesting actually does make sense. And because you've done a lot of that legwork, in many cases, your fee structure is going to be lower because you have already compiled evidence to indicate that your patent is going to be successful. Now, I mentioned before trade secrets. Um, 
I put up some of our most famous of trade secrets out there, but the idea is that you're using non-disclosure contracts or non-disclosure agreements. These are legally binding documents that indicate how you can share information. And in many cases, as people join food companies, they will be requested to sign non-disclosure agreements about what they're seeing and how information is being managed. Coca-Cola, KFC, Heinz Ketchup, these are all great publicly facing examples of how trade secrets can be incredibly successful. Everyone says no one knows what the recipe is for the herbs and flavoring agents that are in Coca-Cola and it's only um, a very, very select few people and the recipes kept in a vault in Atlanta. Same with the Kentucky Fried Chicken. It's a secret blend of 11 herbs and spices and lots of people have tried to knock it off, but KFC is actually using that secret blend of herbs and spices as part of their marketing advantage. Same with Heinz Ketchup. Again, a spice unit that is blended at a different site and then blended into the ketchup at its manufacturing facility such that no single person would see what exactly goes into that product. And again, an incredibly tightly controlled process. Within the intellectual property strategy, anyone who's involved in the process is under legally binding contracts that they cannot go out and disclose any and any of the information about the recipe. And if they were, they would be sued and prosecuted against, as I said before, um, don't have a a trade secret or a non-disclosure agreement unless you are willing to prosecute against it. So this is a case study from a real client and this is indeed a client that I've uh, worked with. Information blinded though. So the client sends a recipe to the co-packer and that co-packer goes in and they have a gentleman's agreement, a handshake, and over coffee they say, oh yeah, of course we'll make this product for you. Ha ha ha, this is great. The co-packer then starts to make adjustments to the formulation to have cost control. And then the original client comes and says, you know what, co-packer, this has been a great run. Um, we are now at a scale where we need to go to a larger manufacturing facility. And we'd like our recipe back and we're going to a new, uh, a new larger co-packer. And the co-packer says, uh, 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 I own this recipe because I've made changes to it. Who owns the recipe? Um, again, my biggest cautionary tale is have a contract in place when going in on uh, handing over proprietary information. And in particular, have different um, clauses within that, uh, within that non-disclosure and contract, co-packing contract to indicate that any changes that are made to the recipe have to be done in agreement with the original client and any of uh, recipes that are developed through that are owned by the original client. The big challenge with this is that if you put in too many restrictions on a co-packing agreement, the company may turn you down because it, it could start to infringe into what are called uh, non-competes. So for example, if you went in and said, hey, we need to go and make our jam at a jam co-packing plant and you say okay fantastic we are the only company that can make strawberry jam and raspberry jam and blueberry jam in this plant because anything else is a non-compete your co-packer may say uh you know what either the cost of doing this is going to be much higher because you are squeezing us out from the ability to make strawberry jam for other clients or they may say you know what we're not even going to deal with you because we need the diversity of small business clients Biggest take home from this slide is make sure in your contracts that you are signing one, that there's non-disclosure on your formulation when you're handing it over to a co-packer, two, that in your co-packing contract that there is an ownership clause about who owns that recipe and that there's some clause about how changes are made to recipes so that if the co-packer needs to adjust the recipe for cost control and or other processing requirements, that there's some sort of change management that retains the intellectual property for the original client. Do take the time when going to co-packers and have actual 
contracts in place and do take the time to have them reviewed by your lawyer. How about this one? This one's a copycat one. Um, so a competitor wants to know what's in a product formulation and these are smaller businesses. And so that competitor gets one of its smart workers and sets them up and has them quote unquote quit the job at the client and they then go and work as a general laborer at another competitor. And you can see where this is going. This is absolutely uh, espionage. I can't stress this enough. The activity that's going on here is extremely not recommended, but have I seen it? Absolutely. Do I recommend it? No. But imagine you have one of your product formulators disguise themselves and going and working as a general laborer in their competitor. Do make sure that you have non-disclosure agreements in place on employees. Make sure that you have ways of locking up and uh, concealing formulation on really important pieces of information. So for example, if you have a spice unit in a sauce that is really important, you may only want certain people scaling those ingredients and having access to the formulation documents. If it's such that you have a really important spice unit, and I've also seen it where they will contract the blending of that spice unit to a third party who will blend that spice unit in secret. And then when you have your formulation, it will be add one bag of spice unit X to this recipe with 10,000 kilos of whatever such that no one knows what that spice unit is. Same with flavoring houses. You can set up uh, special agreements with flavoring houses to blend proprietary blends of natural and artificial flavors for your uh, beverages or other confectionery products, such that no one knows exactly what the formulation is except for the flavoring house. And as such, it's harder than to have that same knockoff approach that said, in the case of copycat products, there are a lot of really talented product developers and they just specialize in copying. And so in many cases, these are uh, private consultants who just copy recipes, pick up a, a bottle of the sauce off the shelf and give them a, a week or two and they'll give you some knockoffs that are as close as possible and this is really not that uncommon. If you think about the entire concept of many private label manufacturers, their whole purpose is to copy. And so as such, it's really, really challenging. It's hard, if not impossible, to patent a recipe. You can trade secret it, you can lock it up in non-disclosure, but as much as you want to think that you have something unique, is it truly unique? Focus on perhaps the branding and marketing messages. That's where you can have uniqueness. Here's another example. Client goes to a grocery retail show with a product. And at that, at that retail show, they are offered by a major national um, retailer to have their product converted over into the private label brand. As you know, many of the national grocery retailers in Canada have private label branding programs such as President's Choice, No Frills, um, Yellow Label, Our Compliments, um, Sensations, all of the different national brands within the grocery sector have their own private label programs. Anyways, the uh, entrepreneur says, you know what, I don't want to sell my concept. I want to keep it as my own brand and grow this business out for myself. And of course, the grocery retailer comes out with a knockoff in a couple months time. What's the entrepreneur's recourse? Um, the big challenge was that the concept was there in full view in the grocery retail show. And at that space, there's no non-disclosure agreement. It was extremely, extremely challenging because in many respects, that client should have had the gumption and the wherewithal to know, you know what, 
it's a David and Goliath sort of scenario. They are a small, small business with a one-off concept. And instead, they should have focused on uh, getting into independent retail and really building out their brand identity so that when people thought of that product, they thought of her brand in particular, rather than thinking of the private label. So in summary on this section, get a Loctite non-disclosure agreement, NDA. Make sure that it's being reviewed by uh, legal representation. There is lots and lots of pro forma um, NDAs available online, but a lot of those pro forma NDAs are not specifically targeted to food manufacturing industries. And so do take the time to have it reviewed by a legal specialist with food manufacturing background. Make sure that if you're going into co-packing that you have uh, rights assigned within that contract on who owns what. And if there's going to be changes within any formulation or process that there is appropriate change management within that. Do have a lawyer review NDA legality and make sure that if you are going ahead and doing all these NDAs that you are going to be willing to prosecute against them. So if, let's say, for example, I go and talk about my clients uh, on YouTube videos or whatever, that you can come and prosecute me. <laughs> Long story short, I'm going to do my best to not do that. Do make sure that you can find opportunity to black box any uh, unique formulation technologies. So for example, if you are making barbecue sauce, can you have someone in secret blend your spice unit such that no one sees what the spice unit is? In some cases, it could be binders or baking blends or flavoring blends that are all bundled up such that general labor doesn't see what the actual formulation is. Do make sure to do a proper human resources background check on people and make sure that people aren't just showing up uh, from your competitors coming to work in your facility. Make sure that they're not, especially not coming from mid-tier management <laughs> or mid-tier R&D to come and suddenly become a general labor within your company. That said, cautionary, know full well that product developers can knock off formulations. Focus on branding and marketing so that you and your company are known for that product. And if another company were to come and knock your product off, they would be seen as the knockoff and yours is the authentic, the real deal. Next, trademarking. Oh, this is where you are starting to have brands and names on your products. So um, it could be a visual brand. It could be a name brand. But... There are so many trademarking databases out there, so just take the time, if you're in Canada, it, the Canada Trademark Database, it's put out by Industry Canada, and you can search all sorts of different terms, look for uh, names, combinations of names, and make sure that you have a unique name that's not going to be an infringement. Oh, here's some examples, and here is a company that actually went and enforced, well, guess what, it was McDonald's, um, a small food service operator in Edmonton, Woodshed Burgers. Uh, this is uh, this is actually public knowledge and I was able to find the, the without prejudice um, cease and desist from McDonald's, but um, Woodshed Burgers in Edmonton had been uh, selling a fish sandwich called the effing filet of fish. And of course that would be in violation of the registration and trademark filet of fish used by McDonald's. And so the cease and desist was enforced and indeed this company, I believe, changed its name and, and it, following in its tongue-in-cheek sort of approach just came up with something else that was even more ridiculous. But do make sure that you are finding a unique name and if you are trying to thumb your nose at a larger corporation, do be extremely cautious. It's the large corporations that have the money and the wherewithal to go and prosecute. They have reputation management teams that just scan the internet for potential opportunities where copyrights may have been infringed. Oh, here's another one, Coffee Culture, which is a um, regional coffee brand in Canada. And they had a Freddo Chino. And Starbucks sued Coffee Culture because a Frettuccino was too close in terminology to a Frappuccino. 
and Frappuccino is a trademark owned by Starbucks. And so coffee culture, through their intellectual property um, data mining, decided to go with Chino as its term. And that was deemed unique enough from a Frappuccino. Why? Because a cappuccino, you cannot trademark the term cappuccino because it's a general use term that has been in the public use as just a standard of identity for a type of classic coffee. So a chino was deemed unique enough from a frappuccino to be trademarkable. So do take the time and make sure that if you are making a name that it is indeed unique enough from other trademarks that are out there. So take the time to search the terms around your term so that your term is not going to be seen as infringement. There are fee structures involved with trademarking. And so oftentimes I will hear from small business saying, oh, we're just going to go out and trademark everything under this term. So there is an applications fee. Um, and then there's renewal fees that need to be done root uh, over and over and over again. If you are going to go and oppose a trademark, you need to pay for it as well. And if you're transferring the, the transfer fees, so the, the big the big challenge, if you're a big company, these these fees are minor, incidental almost. Whereas if you are a small company, just going and trademarking your jam that you want to sell at a farmer's market may not make sense from a cost perspective if you're only going to sell a few hundred units. And I have had small businesses come and say, well, we're going to go and trademark our branding because we have something really unique here. And then I'll ask, so where are you selling it? Oh, well, we sell it in our friend's shop. And I'm like, oh, how many units do you sell typically in a month? Oh, maybe a hundred. It will take you years to pay back your trademark application and renewal fees. So do take a cautious approach to this. So again, I'm going to say in general advice, take the time to search, search, search to make sure that your trademark is truly unique. Do make sure that if you have growth in your business plan, that you are not just trademarking in uh, Canada, that you are also trademarking into the United States and or other jurisdictions. Um, so if you think that you may be selling into Europe at a later point in time, do search other global databases to make sure that your trademark is relevant and you do have to keep paying renewal and registration fees on an annualized basis. So trademarks are different than copyrights. And so copyrights are for visual and written content. And, this, and, and, and I'm bringing this up because I often see with small businesses times where they're in copyright infringement. A good example would be if a food company is taking a recipe from a blog and using it on their website as a means to promote their product. So let's say, for example, I am an apple farmer and I have an apple farm website and I want to have an apple pie recipe. I should not be going on to, I don't know, let's say Canadian Living Magazine's website and lifting their recipe and putting it on my own website because that is deemed a commercial purpose and so you do have to be really really careful when lifting images or lifting photographs or lifting especially if it's going to be deemed as something for a commercial purpose so you'll note for example all of my youtube videos i put into creative commons and uh, non-commercial um free use Creative Commons utilization. Why? Because I want to make sure that I'm not in copyright infringement on anything and in particular copyright infringement can be linked back to commercialization use. So copyright is for visual and written content. Do not go and lift photos. Do not go and lift recipes without proper consent and proper attribution. And in some cases, consent and attribution requires paying of a fee. Plant breeders rights. I'm not going to talk about this too much because this is more for commodities. So if you are a um, 
let's say you are raising wheat or barley or something, you can register your new crop varieties with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. You have to make sure that your crop variety is distinct, uniform and stable. So for example, oftentimes I save seeds from my cucumbers, for example, or my, my uh, Hubbard squash year to year. Why? Because it's cheap for me to do that, but my seed is often not stable. And one year my squash will be nice and big and lovely and the next year it will be horrible and that's not just an agronomic issue it's a seed stability issue you can also have it for vegetative propagation so this is common for fruit trees where you're using um, grafts and and scion wood for grafting to rootstock the the challenge is that many times different plant breeders will have opportunity to buy out content and it is used by some of the commodities companies. So let's say, for example, I'm a large oil seed producer in Canada. I may want to lock up unique breeding rights for seeds that are expressing unique um, fatty acid profiles in their oils. These are uh, of interest and it is, again, intellectual property. Last but not least, let's talk about geographical indication. Um, geographical indication is a form of trademark and this is very common in the wine industry and it's also common in importing food products. It is really important to know which products are DOP if you are using traditional names for food products and in many cases cheeses, wines, olive oils, um, it's predominantly more in Europe than it is in other global areas, but DOP or uh, geographical indication is a global concept protected by the World Intellectual Property Office. And let's jump, I actually want to jump over to these two examples because this might help illustrate what I mean. These are two products. We've got Arla's Apatina cheese and we've got Castello's Borgonzola. But you're looking at it uh, going, wait a second, that's feta cheese and it's gorgonzola, but both feta and gorgonzola are protected designations on those products. And as such, these manufacturers who are making the product in other jurisdictions can't call their cheese that looks like feta cheese and tastes like feta cheese, they can't call it feta cheese because feta cheese has a designated origin protection. Same with gorgonzola cheese has a designated origin. And so another good example, VQA wine. So if you have grapes that are coming from a different designated origin or grape juice coming from Chile or Argentina or Australia, you cannot blend that into grapes grown from Ontario and call it VQA wine. There are very unique standards and you do need to make sure that you're appraised of those standards if you're going to be going and using those brands. Again, the main thing is research, research, research. If you are importing in food products, make sure that the DOP status is in place such that you are not in infringement. And in some cases, you will want to have authenticated traceability on that product. So things like Parma hams or uh, Scottish whiskies. In the case of these products, you want to have authenticated traceability, perhaps blockchain on those products to ensure that that product has not been adulterated and substituted. In the case of those manufactured products coming from Canada, you have to be really aware of all of the similar type products and ensure that your product is not in infringement of DOP labeling and branding of products. It's complicated. Biggest take home is do your research and understand the different dynamics that are out there and be confident to reach out, whether that's to an intellectual property lawyer or to some of the um, innovation centers that are around the country. Reach out to IRAP or WIPO or uh, CIPO, the Canadian Intellectual Property Office, to ask questions. There are people who really want to help and help food companies navigate what's out there. So. My summary advice here, research, 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 inform yourself and take the time to look at the resources 
that are available online. And so many of those databases are available for free. Do your research before going in to see a lawyer. Don't just go in and say, do all the work for me, because that will cost a lot of money. And for small businesses, in many cases, you don't have all that cash. It can be thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars for lawyers and their paralegal teams to do that research. Act as your own paralegal. Do a lot of the initial legwork on your own so that you're not going in and asking for things that they go and tell you you can't do this and then they just send you a bill. Don't get those bills for dead ends. Do take the time to re uh, reach out to the different um, resources that are available to you. So the Canadian Intellectual Property Office, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada also has an intellectual property team. Um, NSERC Technology Access Centres have access to a lot of different uh, and unique resources. And the Industrial Research Assistance Program is also very interested in intellectual property management and innovation practice. And as such, they're a great resource as well. So do take that time. Anyways, as I mentioned before, this was a formal presentation that I gave before for um, CIFST and Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada's um, Tabletop Learning Day. And so I do have a thank you slide. I always thank you. I always love to hear from you and hear what um, suggestions you have for uh, next lectures. Take care. We'll talk to you soon.